Hello, I'm Alan Kohler, founder of Eureka Report, now part of Intelligent Investor, fi- finance presenter on ABC News and columnist for The New Daily. And I'm Stephen Main, Intelligent Investor contributor, City of Manningham councillor and shareholder activist. And we, we are, are The Money, Money Cafe. Cafe. G'day, Stephen. Big day, Alan. Budget wash up. Big day, big big day yesterday. Yes, it was. Um, well, I did. I wasn't in the lockup, so. Um, uh, but I, my wife tells me this is probably my fiftieth budget. I don't think that's correct. Surely not. Can't be true. That's a lot of budgets, Grandpa. Well, it's possibly it's something like that. I mean, I, I think I did start going to doing budgets when I was twenty two, and now I'm seventy two. So that's possibly on and off. And based on the headline in your new daily column this morning, it, it sounds like you're already conceding you're going to lose this bet we're having on interest rates. Yes, possibly. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. That's right. But the, that's um, look. I, th- I think the, the fundamental problem we've got with the economy at the moment is that uh, it's operating. The economy is operating at full capacity, basically. Uh, but a lot of people are doing it tough. Most people, in fact. So there's there's this there's this kind of um, What's what you'd call it a paradox in a way. I mean, the the economy's bar, you know rabbit barreling along, uh, full capacity, pretty much, and um, you know uh, everyone needs to be bailed out, and so the, the political pressure on the government to do something about that is enormous, and so they've done it. They've done a massive tax and spend stimulatory bailout budget, uh, totally focused on the election. I would argue. Quite sort of ir- irresponsible, and um, and even on, but they're they're also predicting a slowdown. Like the unemployment rate to rise to four point five percent. That's a hundred thousand people losing their jobs in the next twelve months. That's right. So and, um, uh, and they and they're predicting the unemployment rate to go higher than the Reserve Bank is predicting it to go. Which is, I mean, they're saying the Reserve Bank is saying four point three percent. The government or Treasury is saying four point five percent. Not much in it, but I mean that's a big difference in in terms of people. Um, that's right. So look, I think it's interesting, and I, I mean, um, the, I sort of what I did for the column this, um, this morning was the sort of big picture numbers, um, and uh, you know they're pretty uh, telling. I, I think you know the, the um, I'll just call it up while I'm speaking to you. The, One of the uh, best <laughs> columns written by someone who wasn't locked up, I reckon. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I had to go live on the ABC News last night and talk to Jeremy Fernandez from the foyer at the ABC and then then <clears throat> jump in the car, come home and go straight into the study and write the column. Now, the, so the, the policy decisions in this bad budget add up to $32.5 billion over five years uh, from the, the, and that includes the financial year that we're in now, right? Um and that's offset by $7.7 billion worth of decisions that increase receipts. So the net effect on the bottom line of the budget, of this budget, is $24.8 billion. Um, so, you know, that's, a, that's, quite, that's quite a lot. Um, and, well, I and, mean, the, and the deficits are going to be, it's $71 billion over the next two years and 112 over the next four years. So two years of so-called profits, including... Nine billion this year, and imagine the company comes out and said, "We've just made nine billion. Oh, by the way, we're going to lose seventy-one billion over the next two years." I mean, that is debt-funded, reckless spending, isn't it? Uh, well, it's certainly um, spending. I mean, I, and it's debt-funded. Is it reckless? Well, well, they call it unavoidable spending on defence, NDIS, and those those other things. Um, I think there's a point to that. Also, I think that the the size of the deficits. Uh, doesn't really don't go really go above one percent of GDP. I think that they're not massive deficits. I guess I'd say that I think that's okay. Well, I mean, the market reaction will be interesting. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, you know, we haven't had the old you know dollar crashes after budget uh, sort of thing. But but the interest rate predictions, um, because it, there is a lot of debt to be issued. If you think about it, debt's going to rise from nine hundred and four billion to one point one trillion over the forward estimates. That's a lot of new bond issuance to fund what are fundamentally stimulatory um, uh, budget surpluses. Yeah. So they're, they're big numbers to tap into the capital markets to stimulate the economy because you're massively structurally in deficit. And I do think that the budget has made uh, rate hikes more likely. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think um, my son bumped into Warren Hogan 
in Parliament House last night. Uh, he was predicting three rate hikes. He's now predicting two. So he's, he's brought his predictions back from three to two rate hikes. According, yeah. I haven't spoken to Warren. I've just – my son Chris um, passed that on to me. So, But he reckons two's locked in. Two rate hikes are locked in. I reckon that's possibly correct, you know. So I'm going to be giving you $100. No, You yeah, are. It was good to hear at least we had one cola in the budget lockup yesterday. But you know yes. what it also is interesting? It makes the RBA board spill situation even more interesting because the what happens now with interest rates is going to be massively politically impactful, you know, a bit like 2007 when Glenn Stevens jacked up interest rates during the campaign, which helped finish off Howard and Costello. And you've still got this standoff between the opposition and the government about whether there'll be a board spill of the RBA when they create the new interest rate setting body or whether all the current directors, majority appointed by the coalition, get to grandfather over in, onto the new all-powerful interest rate setting board. So it's a very interesting situation now, the standoff between, you know, the government and the RBA and uh, and where things will go on interest rates because I agree, I think it's probably going to be up as well and that's absolutely politically toxic for the government. It is. Particularly, yeah, well, they've got a, they've got an election coming now. I mean, I, I mean, I I think that uh, an election campaign is like a budget because it's full of spending and all sorts of you know uh, uh, measures. So there is going to be another budget, effectively, either they're a proper full f- a formal budget because the elections in May next year, and then they have a budget in April, um, which is I think the most likely thing. But even if they have an early uh, election. The election campaign itself is like a budget. So it's kind of, um, you know, a lot of these stuff, a lot of these things in this budget sort of get overtaken, I think, by the election. Um, but the, the, what they're trying to do with this budget is set things up, to set themselves up for uh, and paint the picture of what they're trying to do um, with the economy. And I think that, um, you know, there was a lot in there about housing, a lot in there about, um, you know, uh, made, a future made in Australia. Um, uh, I, I mean, I... I don't think their housing stuff is going to be all that effective because I don't think they're doing enough w- where it matters. Um, and I think that the they've got targets rather than actual um, actual actions. But at least they're focusing on it. I mean, because I, I think you know when we talked about the economies at full uh, full stretch, and particularly the labour market, three point eight percent unemployment, um, uh, the economy is f- uh, fully employed pretty much. And uh, a lot of people are doing it tough. That's because of housing. I mean, I mm. think the fundamental the fundamental problem with cost of living is is not so much um, inflation, see c- consumer price inflation, but housing inflation, uh, which has you know fundamentally increased the costs of everybody by double over the past twenty years. Yeah, but it's but it's a, it's the price of money as well. I mean, it, it was manageable having the most indebted households in the world when interest rates were less than one. It's not manageable when they're at four point three five officially and six point eight percent on the average standard variable. So exactly, that's right. Yeah. So it's just a, a huge leverage on households, and the electric fence of uh, of, of thirteen interest rate rises has just uh, smashed household balance sheets and household spending. So um, it is interesting how they are setting up for the for the future. I mean, they have cut immigration numbers significantly, and interestingly, Dutton was on AM this morning on on the ABC slamming them for increasing immigration by 1.57 million over the next five years. So he was still trying to do a scare campaign on immigration, even when the government's cutting it from 400,000 plus to to 260. And uh, interesting also, I think the the Labor Party is really setting Dutton up on health because they're really freezing the PBS, more extra sort of free Medicare, whole bunch of health stuff. And I know they're going to go Dutton big time on when you were last the health minister, you introduced the co-payment, you smashed public hospital funding. So they're going to do a massive scare campaign against Dutton on health, on his record. And this budget sets up for that as well, whilst also trying to inoculate the Dutton scare campaign on immigration, which was already being rolled out this morning. It was the coalition that that started the whole immigration thing in 2005 by doubling and then and then tripling the amount of immigration. They went from they took immigration from 100,000 a year as it was for a long time uh, up to 300,000. And uh, you know, <clears throat> so they they kind of started it uh, and the and the big increase in immigration over the last couple of years has basically been a catch up from the 
um, from the um, uh, from the pandemic. And, yeah. I, and look, and really the. Uh, the problem is not so much the amount of immigration because we've got tremendous staff shortages, shortages everywhere. We've, but the problem is that we don't have a capacity in the housing, in the in the construction industry to make enough houses. Yeah, and the, and the issue with immigration is well, it's 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 I'd argue the biggest thing that turbo turbo has been the, the international students, which is now back again to to record levels. It's a massive earner for us as a nation, but it does also uh, feed into the housing crisis issue or the housing inflation issue. So. Uh, interesting that they've, you know, they've they've capped numbers. They're forcing universities to actually get into the housing ownership or housing provision market if they're going to bring in students. So that's a that's a bit of a regulatory burden to say, you know, Melbourne University, you, you, you've got the most international students in on any campus in the world. There at Parkville, it's fourteen thousand. It's the most in the world. So you, Mel, Melbourne is one of the great university cities. Forty two percent of the of the population in the city of Melbourne, the council area, are students, and all of a sudden University of Melbourne's being told you've got to actually own and, and have control of a certain amount of student housing if you can grow or continue to hold your world record 14,000 international students. I mean, I don't know. I think that's uh, an interesting proposition. Well, we've got to have international students because if we didn't, we'd all starve because there'd be no one to deliver our food, Stephen. Well, well that, that's exactly right. I mean, it is basically it's a... It's a it's a cloaked up uh, cheap international labour scheme. So we don't have foreign workers, you know, because of the you know, influence of the unions and things like that. But we call them international students, and it sort of serves that similar role. Um, and uh, I mean, I remember asking at the Domino's AGM last year, "How are you going with labour shortages since they've reopened the, um, uh, the the tap on international students?" And the CEO Don Mead said, "Oh, it's much better in Melbourne and Sydney now." We're, Labor shortages are over, and that's basically all the international students are back delivering pizzas for Domino's. Well, and Uber Eats, and Uber right. Eats, exactly right. Yeah. So, uh, but look, we've got tons of questions, so we better get going. Is there anything else you need to say before we move on to questions, Stephen? Oh, I just wanted to say I, I liked the the budget measure of three point two five billion for Victorian Labor's North East Link project, um, which has blown out from ten billion to twenty six billion, and uh, and that comes through the city of Manningham, and uh, they've got more money now to pay us the more than ten million they owe us for the land they've taken to build that project. So very pleased to see that the feds have bailed out the twenty-six billion dollar North East Link project, and looking forward to a oh, good old city of Manningham picking up some of that three point two five billion onto our debt-free balance sheet. Very good. Okay, um, just before we go to the questions, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Thinking about starting your wealth creating journey but not sure where to put your hard earned dollars? InvestSmart can help. It offers a free quiz that makes it easy to find the right InvestSmart ETF portfolio to help reach your goals. Just visit investsmart.com.au and hit get started. Answer a few simple questions about your goals and how much you want to invest and you'll get a tailored statement of advice with a portfolio recommendation. Visit investsmart.com.au for a no obligations free statement of advice. Brought to you by Investment Advice, AFSL 334107. Okay, Stephen, you can do the first question. So 22 questions this week, Alan, 19 from men and three from women. So let's start with Kate, who says, Alan, I'm impressed by all you do. What is your top productivity tip and how do you stay focused to write such long reports? Uh, well, I suppose my, <laughs> my main productivity tip is to focus, completely focus on what you're doing at the time. That's what I do anyway. I mean, I, it might sound like that might sound obvious, um, but I think uh, that I think it's possible to kind of be distracted by other things while you're doing one thing. Uh, so, you know, I, I sort of do one thing at a time and uh, I completely focus on that and I don't think about anything else until it's done. Now, what about little tips? Like are you – you're obviously very good with spreadsheets. You've got a magnificent little black book of contacts and people who send you things. But are you a, a one, two or three screens guy when you lock yourself away in that study at home there? One. It's a big screen. A, yeah, that's so, not very productive, Alan. All the well-organised people are running at least two screens now, aren't they? Oh, that's, no, no, that's, um, that's inefficient. You don't need two screens. You just need one. You need to be able to flip between – between things you got open, that's all. That's all right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm like you. I'm a dinosaur with one screen as well. So there you go. 
Now, Simon says, you mentioned in the last episode that the super industry is wonderful. Well, this must be mostly true. It hasn't always led to greater wealth inequalities. Fund managers, brokers, lawyers and accountants reap enormous salaries and fees from serving them. This includes super funds investing in other funds who take another clip. The most extreme are private equity and venture capital funds where the managers reap huge rewards. How can this feasting off the people's retirement savings be moderated? <laughs> feasting, yes. Well, look, of course, it was always going to create a big industry, superannuation, and three, three trillion plus uh, sitting in super, and that gets managed. And look, I mean, I, I think that um, I think the fact that the the people who manage that money uh, tend to get paid percentages of what they the amount they manage, I think that's the problem. I mean, the the super funds themselves pay salaries to their investment managers and everyone else who who works there. But then they employ fund managers who get paid percentages, and so uh, and the the percentage tends to stay the same um, as the amount increases, and it increases through through legislation, and so everyone's just feasting on these per- with percentages, and I think that's the problem. But I don't think we're going to get rid of that, do you, Stephen? I'm no. Not- well, I, I mean, I think that it is a massive honeypot. But at least with industry funds, they're, they're not making a profit. And at least with things like ETFs and index investing, we have seen some lower cost options come in. So the typical sort of overcharging stock picker, you know, the Perpetuals or the Magellans, um, they're, they're, not making, you know, they're, they're not making nearly as much as they used to. And it's now more sort of the, the low cost um, index managers. But it is an interesting question. Like, if Keating had never introduced compulsory super, I asked the question, what would our big four banks today be worth? Would they be worth almost $500 billion? Because at one level, people used to just usually used to save through their home loan. You buy a house, you pay it off, that was your super. That's, that's how you did it. And the banks didn't make that much profit. But now you've got $3 trillion plus of super, $3 trillion trust, uh, plus of mortgages on homes, and just one great big money merry-go-round and the banks clipping the ticket every which way. Yes, and it is true that the industry funds don't make a profit, but the money's, money is managed by companies that do make a profit, um, you know, because they don't, they don't invest the money directly themselves that much. Most of it is invested with fund managers who are for-profit enterprises uh, that charge a percentage. I think that's the problem. Yeah, although I'm pleased that they are bringing a lot of the capacity in house now, the industry funds like oh, they and are, I, IFM, the infrastructure play. I mean, they, they've got a lot of talent working for them. Um, they're paying a lot of people a lot of money internally because if you're competing with fund managers and you to try and put build an in house capacity, you know there would be many hundreds of people working for industry funds on solid six figure numbers across the board. I would argue because you know that's a Big skillful capacity to outperform and uh, and manage those sort of vast sums of money, but I, I'm actually really proud of our model. I think industry funds are an absolute national champion, and and they've been a, a great a great innovation for Australia. We used to have a capital problem uh, borrowing from the world. Now we are a net capital exporter, primarily because of this paternalistic compulsory super system, which has uh, taken what you know wages off everyone for. 20 plus years and has built up this massive national pile of savings, which has uh, has uh, given us a powerful national balance sheet. Couldn't agree more. Andy says, I think there's a shift of tax not talked about in the media, but, sin- but uh, talked about the media much since the Victorian government massively increased land taxes. As an example, I've got two positively geared investment properties in my company that had all net profits taxed at 30% and this tax revenue went to the federal coffers. All of a sudden, an extra $4,000 of Victorian state land taxes appeared, on the, which the entire sum went to the Victorian state government in full. However, that amount, when paid, was fully deductible at a federal level, which reduced the federal government's kitty by $1,300. So my view is that this state land tax also reduces federal tax take as an unintended consequence. My question is, am I correct or am I missing something, as this point seems to get no media attention, mentions or discussion? You're uh, not... Incorrect. That's absolutely correct. Uh, land tax is deductible uh, at a um, at a federal level from your tax. That's true. Yeah, Which I mean, is- and like as a as a local government councillor, a lot of people say that we should tax business and you know, commercial property owners more um, and have a differential rate. 
and have less for households because at least the business can tax deduct their rates. So from an after-tax point of view, your community is better off if you take more of your rates from those that can tax deduct it. And that's actually quite an interesting, interesting uh, point. Um, and there are a lot of differential rates around because the commercial people can, uh, can claim the tax deduction on their rates. Probably I'd argue that the biggest example of where the feds could lose some revenue is once again, they've gone with the ridiculous US $60 a tonne forecast for iron ore. So all these forecast deficits, 112 billion over four years, are based on a US $60 a tonne iron ore price when we know at the moment it's over 100. Um, But imagine if WA increased their flat iron ore royalty from 7.5% to similar to the Queensland coal uh, progressive scheme where it rises to a peak of 40% when the coal price gets above $300, that would bring in an extra 10 or $15 billion a year to the WA government and all of that would be tax deductible. So that would cost the federal government $5 billion because the WA government would be getting a fair price for their iron ore. So it's pretty small fry when talking about Victorian land tax it's been big fry with Queensland with coal, where the Queensland government is now getting $15 billion a year from their coal miners. And I'd say the big one is if WA actually properly taxed the iron ore boys, then the federal revenues would, would, would suffer commensurate losses because it would all be tax deductible. Yeah, and I must say I don't think it's unintended either. I think that it's just a quiet way that the federal government supports the states. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Now, Millie says, I'm a long-time listener and admirer, initially forced to listen to you on my way to school by my dad, who was an Alan Kohler tragic and gets grumpy when you don't do the ABC finance report. In fact, he urged me to email on the basis the Money Cafe is looking for more female correspondents. I was also honoured and amazed to hear that we shared a birthday on the 26th of April, and my dad reckons that's why I was drawn to studying finance and economics at uni, now in my second year. Anyway, Millie's question is, I'd love your take on whether governments around our country have gone bonkers and totally lost their way. After hearing this week that the Queensland government is splashing out $1,000 to every household, that's a $2.5 billion spend to buffer rising electricity costs, which some may argue the government themselves have partially caused. And this duplicity of talking tough on fiscal restraint and fiscal financial rectitude while seemingly spending like drunken sailors and denying that they are in any way contributing to inflation. (laughs) <laughs> Look, the, the, the power cuts, I mean, are, are people in Queensland going to be paying anything for electricity next year, Alan? I mean, you've got $1,000 from... Uh, from the, the state, state government and now $300 from $300 from the feds. I know. It's, the, uh, the, it is amazing. The only way Queensland is doing it and they're funding it is from all the coal royalties. I mean, that, that's the deal they've said. They've said we've slugged the largely foreign coal miners and we're giving it back to the people by subsidising their power. And pretty popular, I think... Uh, Sort of, you know, makes a lot of sense. But what do you reckon about the the three hundred going to everyone and not being means tested? Apparently, it's going to be a seventy five dollar credit each quarter paid by the power companies. So if you've done the right thing and gone completely renewable and you're off grid, thanks to your solar and your batteries, you won't be getting some belching power company giving you a three hundred dollar credit because it only goes to those who are still on the grid. Yeah, look, I think it's I think it's ridiculous giving it to everybody. I mean, really, and and the answer, I mean, his his answer to when challenged on that, Jim Chalmers said, "Oh, it's because the uh, middle income people are doing it tough as well." Yeah, but sure, but the billionaires aren't doing it tough. Let's face it. So um, I don't. Yeah, the rich the rich are getting three hundred dollars, and it's costing everyone else an enormous amount of money. I just. Think but I I do like the it's system design, Alan. Here, I do like the simplicity of implementation. If you create something where every household has got to register, apply, you know, then the people who are not very financially literate, a bit disorganised, they might be poor and they won't get it. Whereas this system, it automatically just comes off your bill to everyone. So it's a bit like a capital raising where everyone gets treated the same because you get compensated if you don't participate. So I don't mind that a few billionaires might get it because the simplicity of delivering the benefit is is a significant advantage. Yeah, that's true. I, I pay that. Um, Paul says, can you discuss the pros and cons of the US mortgage system which provide 30-year fixed, term, fixed rate loans compared to ours? Given that our financial markets price out to 10 years, isn't there, is there a reason why we don't have a 10-year fixed rate mortgage product? Yes. 
The reason is because we don't have um, something called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, uh, th- these things were set up by um, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in 1938, um, coming out of the Great Depression uh, as a part of the as a part of the New Deal. And uh, the, the, what these bodies do in the US, and they're still around, and they're loved um, in the US, what they do is that they buy the mortgages off banks um, and uh, parcel them up and sell them to investors so that they provide the banks with liquidity. So the banks don't have to sit there holding these 30-year fixed rate loans in the United States because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac buy them off them, take them off them and give them to um, big investors like pension funds. Now, we've got this $3, billion, $3 trillion in- industry fund uh, uh, superannuation system, so they would love to buy these mortgages and have them as, as good, solid uh, investments, but we just, need to have, we just need to have a government body that does it. Um, but for some reason, and I don't understand why, um, Labor governments in Australia simply have never done it. They, you know, we've had tons of Labor governments and they've just not really seen, uh, seen the reason to do it. And I don't know why. Maybe they're still scared about losing that election post-war when they were going to nationalise the banks, Alan. Yeah, well, that's right. So it was very controversial. And also in 1938 or so when, uh, when FDR did it, we had a conservative government. It wasn't until later that John Curtin got in. Um, and by then it was the war. And, you know, it was 1941 and we're in the middle of a war and it was too late. And so it, so the moment, moment passed. But that's still no excuse for um, Chifley not doing it and then Whitlam not doing it and then Hawke and Keating not doing it and now and then Rudd and now Albo. They could easily do it. They just I don't know why they don't. But, no, I mean, have, have, I'm not aware of any other countries that have, have done that system either. I mean, it's a bit, it's a uniquely American thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. That's right. But I, I agree. I like the benefit of thirty, you know, a thirty-year fixed loan. I mean, how how good is that for stability in your in your housing arrangements? Yeah, that's right. So for the whole t- time of t- basically for the term of your loan, you know what you've got. In Australia, the fixed rate loans max out at five years. So you yeah. know, and as we've seen, a lot of people come off low fixed rate mortgages and then get whacked with this big increase in their um in their repayments. Now, Lachlan says, I've observed a significant trend where Australian engineering firms establish offices overseas to outsource design work to countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, India and Bangladesh. These countries have a surplus of skilled engineers with cheap rates and they're currently facing a lack of sufficient work locally, unlike in Australia where we don't have enough people and everything is so bloody expensive. Given the high costs associated with infrastructure projects in Australia, why aren't we considering the engagement of short-term migrant workers from these countries for labour and construction work? Good point. But, um, you know, one of the problems with uh, housing is, and I know he's talking about engineering and infrastructure, but, but it also extends to housing. Um, uh, the problem is that there's a huge amount of immigration, as we've been talking about, but only about 5% of those immigrants are in the construction industry or engineering. Uh, they're mostly working, uh, well, obviously the students are uh, delivering food, but the, they're mostly going into services uh, industries like uh, healthcare, aged care, um, uh, uh, other things like that, and uh, they're not moving into construction. So, so the, they, the amount of immigration tends to increase the demand on housing and infrastructure uh, without expanding the workforce that build the things. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, I think Australia's got a, you know, part of our culture, the fair go, is that... We, we don't do the cheap foreign labour thing, and that's part of the union power, CFMEU, um, but both sides basically agree with it. I mean, and so you have to be on the on the, the skill shortage list and you have to be sponsored in. I remember being at the, the AMA group annual meeting last year. AMA is a, the Australia's largest cash a smash repair company, and they, their shares have gone to the dogs. They've never recovered from COVID, but the CEO said during the meeting, he said, oh, look, we're we're bringing in 100 skilled technicians from the Philippines over the next 12 months to try and turn our business around because the labour market is so tight. So that is you know, a big public company going to the Philippines and coming up with 100 workers to work in the smash repair industry to try and, you know, it will lower the cost of, of smash repairs because there just isn't enough skilled technicians who are prepared to work as panel beaters, basically, in, in Australia. But 
it's quite a highly regulated, complex bureaucratic system. It's not easy to do it at scale. You've got to find accommodation for them. So, you know, and I think it, it's it's probably could be not deregulated, but, the, you know, it could be made a little bit more easier to do uh, where you've got, you know, like infrastructure where you've just got massive cost blowouts like the North East Link going from $10 billion to $26 billion, and everyone talking about all these people on 200000 a year to... Um, you know, so I think I think there's an issue, but uh, it's also a great Australian tradition that we've got the world's highest minimum wage, and uh, we don't do the cheap labour thing. And um, but that makes things more expensive. It's a trade-off. Simon says I love the podcast, but sometimes I worry about you. Oh, Simon! Someone suggested splitting taxable pay between couples, and you weren't sure what the difference would, what difference that would make. A one-income family with 100,000 income would normally pay 22,967 in tax last year. Two people on 50k would each pay 6,717, uh, or 13,434 total. Therefore, tax saving of 9,533 for the couple, which is why it will never be implemented. Of course, although such drastic measures might be required to stop the baby drought. I don't think I said that. Uh, I don't think we said that it wouldn't make a difference in the amount of tax being paid. I, th- I thought it wouldn't make much of a difference to um, people getting married and having kids, but uh, that's probably, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. What do you I think? actually wouldn't be opposed to a bit of income splitting. I mean, if you've got someone on 150 and and someone else earning nothing, then, um, you know, the idea that you could put maybe a maximum of 50000 across to your, to your, your, your partner's salary because your whole household, you know, you might be sitting there with three kids and you've got just in- household income of 150, and you're paying 50 grand in tax or whatever it is. That's a that's a big slug. But of course, any any use of that would obviously hurt income tax receipts for the government, and they've yeah, gone up by 23 percent to well over 300 billion in the last two years. So we're one of, we're a very high taxing country when it comes to income tax. So I, I, anything which provides a bit of relief on that, on top of stage three. I personally would support, but I can't see any government doing it anytime soon. It would cost too much. That's right. Yeah, it would cost a lot. That's right. So, And there'd be a bit of rorting going in, you know. So I mean, people obviously wouldn't be practical. Contractors now do, do income splitting now. The, pro- the problem is, and what I think we're talking about here, is um, employees being allowed to in- in- uh, income split. And I think that that's probably never going to happen. No, I don't think so. Now, Peter says uh, he's a long-time listener, first-time emailer. Did either, either of you note the AGM results from G8 Education where they released the number of shareholders, not just the shares that voted for each resolution? So G8 Education has 17,000 shareholders and they disclosed that only 430 voted. Now, Peter, you're a man after my own heart. This is something I've been calling on companies to do and the likes of Qantas, Maya, Tabcor, Dexas, the ASX are now doing it. And this is because it's it's solving two problems. There's a crisis in retail shareholder participation. It's down to about 2% at AGMs. And often in capital raisings, it's also pitifully low that they just aren't opening the mail or receiving the emails. So if the companies disclose how many shareholders voted at least we'll know the size of the problem. And you can also get a sense of where the retail shareholders are at because quite often you get a vote where it's 98% in favour of the, re- re- the remuneration report. But when you get the headcount data, it'll be 50-50 where there'll be, you know, 250 shareholders who vote in favour and 230, I often argue, grumpy old white men who vote against every remuneration report. Um, so, yeah, put the data out there. And you've got a better insight, and well done to G8 Education for voluntarily releasing how many shareholders voted for and against, not just what the big institutional shareholders did, swamping all the mum and dad shareholders who 98% of them don't bother to vote because they've given up because they think their vote is worthless and powerless. Thank you, Stephen. Kate says, I've heard the Stage 3 tax cuts will not be inflationary because the RBA has already factored these in and they were legislated years ago. But how does this work? I don't get it. If inflation is the price of goods and services and needs to be kept at 2 to 3%, they factored in, they factored for one of those items to go up. Do they change their 2 to 3% rule or do they just ignore that one bas- item in the basket in their 2 to 3% calculations? No, no, they are inflationary, of course uh, they are. But the thing is that the what matters to the RBA is whether the inflation rate, uh, the inflation rate is coming down in accordance with their forecasts. 
and their forecasts factor in the stage three tax cuts. And so they forecast that inflation will be within the 2 to 3% band, which is what they're trying to achieve, by the end of next year. And that includes stage three tax cuts. Um, so, uh, yes, they're inflationary, but the, the RBA is not worried about it because they're okay with inflation coming down to below 3% by the end of next year. And that's, that's fine. As long as they, their forecasts continue along those lines, uh, then they won't increase interest rates. Um, so that's the issue. I think the best way to measure it, I mean, it's all just one piece of the pie in an overall budget. But look, it is interesting, isn't it, to say we're introducing a very large tax cut in this budget and we're going from a $9 billion surplus to a $28 billion deficit is, as part of the process. So, um, you know, it's thirty-eight, thirty-seven $37 billion turnaround in the budget bottom line, which is, I would argue, inflationary and stimulatory. And that's partly delivered by, you know, a very substantial stage three tax cut right across the board. Yeah, that's right. Now, Tim says, what does the team think of the debt-ridden binfire of Perpetual and the KKR offer? Should the board of management be cleared out and sole pats allowed to take over? Well, this is a, a corporate takeover play. I mean, I'm pleased at one level that Perpetual's not being taken over like everybody else from Borrell down. Borrell's fallen this week, Alan, with Kerry Stokes getting above 90%. So Perpetual's selling one of their two businesses, the corporate trust business, to KKR for over $2 billion. The shares fell 7%. People have been attacking them. I personally think that they would have been better off to do a demerger rather than a cash sale because the problem with doing a big cash sale is you, you generate a big corporate tax bill, whereas if you distribute shares in the entity to your own shareholders, you delay the tax payment and then... Quite often after a demerger, you do get a situation of two plus two equals five because someone comes along and pays a big price for one of the two entities that have come out of the demerger. And that apparently seems to be what Anglo-American is looking at doing with BHP. They've announced a demerger overnight, which they are hoping will ultimately increase the price of what anyone, BHP, will pay for the the, the rump of what's left, which is primarily the, the copper and the iron ore. So as a general rule, I think, you know, Perpetual probably should have done a demerger, and, uh, but I'm glad that Sol Patterson haven't taken them over because Sol Pats, I think, is just doing a revenge play because Perpetual was constantly telling them to unwind their controversial cross-shareholding with Brickworks, and I think Sol Pats came along and said, oh, well, we'll take over Perpetual and shut them up. A revenge play. A revenge it. play. So, oh. um, yeah, but, uh, I mean, you got a view on that one? I uh, know, oh, I agree. I think the demerger would have been better. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I th and I think Anglo, you're right about Anglo-American. This probably will uh, increase the price. Yeah. Uh, second last question from Steve. Dollar cost averaging calls for inputs to be staged over time so as not to be exposed to any event in the market and also to benefit from any drops or dips in the market. Hence, buying the dip. My question is, what constitutes a dip that would compel a dollar cost averaging investor to buy into the market? A drop of 1%, 2% or 5%. I think you're misunderstanding dollar cost averaging. The, the, uh, those sort of investors, dollar cost averaging investors, don't actually buy the dip uh, deliberately. What they do is they put the same amount in each month or quarter or week or whatever it is or year. They just, they just automatically say it's monthly. They'll automatically invest $1,000 into the market, uh, usually into a, uh, an ETF of the whole market. They'll just put it into the market, whatever the, whatever the price is at the time. That means that they, um, they tend to just uh, buy when the market is lower um, and they're not actually trying to – what they're not doing is following uh, the herd when the, sh when the market goes up and everyone's buying. They're just putting the same amount in. They're not, uh, they're not sort of buying more than usual. Well said, Alan. We'll finish off with Bosch. My 13-year-old son had a, has a very small parcel of shares in Argentinian-focused lithium brine play Lake Resources and, has, and had received an offer of a share purchase plan and a $5 million capital raising for the company. So far, the company, company's been a roller coaster ride with shares purchased at $0.90, cents, rising to a peak of $2.30 and currently bopping around the $0.07 cents per share. I'm trying to explain what the company is doing and offering and the negative and positive impact to his small shareholding and what he should or should not do 
One lesson we have both learned is to be very clear on any instructions to buy and sell between the two of us as he wanted to sell at $2.30. So he says, well, Bosch, the kid was right. You should have sold your Lake Resources shares at $2.30 because they're today at six cents. They're one of these lithium roller coaster stocks that went through the roof and then crashed when the price fell by more than 80, 80%. And uh, the share purchase plan you've talked about was an offer at seven cents. And with the stock currently at six cents, this was one to avoid. And they only raised. 1.5 million from 269 silly investors out of 37,000. This is how big the lithium play has been, Alan. A company you've never heard of, which has got a hopeful play in Argentina, has 37,000 retail shareholders. So every every man and his dog was jumping into every lithium play and a lot of money has been lost if you got in too late. And, um, you know, I just I just say, well, well done in avoiding that one, but you should have followed your son's advice and got out at 2.30 and be wary of companies that market share purchase plans to you because the more you hear from a company with a share purchase plan, the more out of the money or problematic it might be. So, um, but uh, you yes. just usually wait to the last day. You're offered $30,000 worth of shares. Wait to the last day. If it's in the money, take them up. If it's not in the money, don't. And the best share purchase plans also have what's called a volume-weighted average price alternative where they say you can have the shares for the same price as the institutions in the placement, say, you know, 50 cents, or you can have them at a 2% discount to the last five days of trading before the offer closes. That is the best practice share purchase plan. And when a company offers you that, you can apply for the shares early knowing you've got downside protection if the market crashes before the closing date of the share purchase plan. Well said. That's great. And the other thing to say perhaps about this is, in principle, you shouldn't be selling at six cents either um, no. because you know, because lithium is a long-term, uh, definitely a long-term bull case. I mean, there's uh, definitely you know more lithium going to be required uh, as everyone starts driving electric cars. But the thing is that the question is about this particular company, are they going to make it? And so you need to, in order to decide whether or not to sell at six cents, you have to look at their cash flow statements and to see if, how much money they've got in the bank, how much money they're burning, how long it's going to take for their Argentinian brine uh, operation to get going and um, when they can start making some cash in And you're the not going to be saved by Albo's uh, big government uh, splash for all things critical minerals, uh, you know, production tax credits for... Arafura, uh, and because uh, they're only helping the Aussie players, so this this mob uh, they're in Argentina. So, so you uh, have to. So the thing to do with companies like Lake Resources, you've got to look, go to their website, call up the cash flow statement, see what they see how much cash they're burning, how much they've got in the bank, how long is that going to last? Have they got much chance of raising much money? Because as you can see, they're not they're not raising they're not able to raise much. They've got one point five million out of a out of a big um, capital raising, and. Um, you know, the next thing to do is to uh, sell them if uh, if you don't think they're going to make it because they might not. And I always remember the comment by iron ore billionaire Chris Ellison of Mineral Resources at, at their AGM a couple of years ago. That he was ta- everyone was talking about lithium and blah, 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 and he said, "Have you ever tried to run a lithium mine? It's very difficult." So oh, is, that, um, is that right? <laughs> it's there's a lot of lithium in the world, but it's not the easiest thing to actually deliver into a final Tesla vehicle where you're making a truckload and there's a big land grab all over the world where everyone's promising to be the next big thing in lithium, but it's very expensive and complicated to value at it. And there's a truckload of it around and a lot of people promising the world and quite a few of them won't deliver on their promises of actually coming up with a viable business model of value adding a lithium mining operation. Well, that was great, Stephen. Great to talk to you again today and thanks everyone to for listening to today's episode of Money Cafe. I'll be back next week with James Thompson. Send in your question at to the Money Cafe at EurekaReport.com.au and we'll answer it together and keep them short. Till then, I'm Alan Kohler, founder of Eureka Report, etc. And I'm Stephen Mayne, a fortnightly contributor for Alan at the Intelligent Investor. <laughs> <laughs>